Welcome to another edition of Brain Dialogues. Today we have a guest with us, Dr. Sanjay C. Kutan. He is the Chief Technology Officer of Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, GCMD. Dr. Sanjay has held various positions in the private and public sector across his career. Prior to joining GCMD, he was the Executive Director of the Singapore Maritime Institute which is responsible for finding maritime research projects with industry and building local capabilities in the maritime sector. He is currently a council member of the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore and a member of FTI's Pro Enterprise Panel. In 2020, he was also appointed to the management committee of Ecolabs, the Center of Innovation for Energy and advisory board of QI Square and direct counselor for the Central Singaporean Community Development Council. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ravi. Let me begin by asking you, uh, can you share some light on what is GCMD and then what does it do to help the maritime industry? Sure, happy to. Um... So GCMD was established on the 1st of August uh, last year, 2021. It was born out of the recommendation made by an international advisory panel on decarbonization that was set up by the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore the year before. And this recommendation was made to the government uh, at the last Singapore Maritime Week and was announced then. Between the announcement in April and the establishment in August, six companies stepped forward to fund, co fund the setting up of the center. And this is uh, a BW, DNB Foundation, Samcorp Marine, Eastern Pacific Shipping, ONE, and uh, BHB. And each one of them put in $10 million. Uh, uh, together with MPA matching it with another $60 million over the next five years. The mission of the Global Center of Maritime Decarbonization is really around shaping standards, deploying solutions, financing projects, and bringing the community of stakeholders in the maritime sector together to really move forward with one voice in relation to decarbonization. At the center of everything we do is really about pilot and demonstration of technologies which are in the pre-commercial stage but looking for platform to demonstrate their value to the industry and because we are not for profit uh, organization all the lessons will be shared with the maritime community so that everyone can move forward together so uh, let us talk about the current uh, scenario of decarbonization with all the goals set uh, 2030, 2050, uh, traveling towards uh, net zero. So uh, what do you think uh, are the current challenges uh, that maritime industry is facing or the barriers towards moving this uh, decarbonization? Yeah, it's, as you would be aware that first thing, the maritime sector is not homogeneous. It's very heterogeneous not only in terms of vessel type, but also in their use cases. Some are containers, some are bulk, liquid bulk, some are dry bulk. And the routes are also very different from different ports. So the first challenge, uh, a lot of ship owners are asking themselves, which fuel should I, which low carbon fuel should I begin to use? Because not all low carbon fuels are available from all ports. Not all low, low carbon fuels have reached production levels that is high enough that they can be assured of such supply. Uh, and not all low carbon fuels are compatible as a drop-in with the current fuels as well. So there's a multiple challenges that a ship owner or ship operator has to consider uh, before they make a decision because once you build your vessel, it is going to be around for 20 or 25 years. Uh, and the entire supply chain needs to move together. It's a, chick it's a chicken and egg situation. 
you port build infrastructure to cater to a vessel that comes once a month? Or do vessels change their entire propulsion system and look for a port to refuel? So somewhere along the line, that's why the collaborative nature of solving the maritime decarbonization conundrum must be to move together so that uh, there's sufficient de-risking across the, the value chain. You rightly mentioned about uh, the, the uh, number of fuels and the choices that could be available. So what is, uh, in your perspective, uh, because we hear about uh, ammonia, um, hydrogen, biofuels, especially biofuels. So, so what do you think will uh, proceed uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, changing scenario? Right. So if you look at the variables that one has to deal with in deploying new fuels, the first thing is the deployment infrastructure and the current engines. Now, it, it, it would be unreasonable for everyone to write off all this infrastructure just to cater to new cryogenic fuels. So therefore, if you look at biofuels, they can actually use the current infrastructure uh, and be deployed quite easily to meet at least the near-term targets in terms of as a drop, drop in fuel. So we anticipate that that is the easiest path today. One of the big challenges is people say there's not enough production of it. But I think as as supply as demand side commits to taking uptaking the supply, you will see production ramp up as well to meet that uh, supply demand imbalance. So I think the, the the one of the earlier ones that we can move forward with with the current infrastructure with minor modifications uh is the the biofuel scenario what we want what we don't want to do is to promote biofuels that compete with the food chain uh and there are new solutions in gen 2 gen 3 gen 4 biofuels whether you use use cooking oils and the emerging alkyl oil uh, uh these fuels could be very viable uh, alternatives to the what we used to known as gen generation one biofuels that came from uh, food crops and uh, we want to avoid that definitely uh, wherever possible the other fuel that is fast coming into the space is lng uh, and lng is it's definitely the cleanest of all the fossil fuels and lng opens up the opportunity of bio lng in the future because once you build the LNG infrastructure, bio LNG can be a nice drop in or a future replacement to make sure that infrastructure is not wasted. So the, what, the transition to LNG is also an uh, interesting opportunity. The transition to ammonia, uh, the next one is actually to think about if I go to ammonia, is the question on methanol. Methanol uh, is also easily deployed in a way. I mean, there, there are engines today that can burn uh, methanol in propulsion systems. But of course, the color of methanol does make a difference. And the emerging technologies around e-methanol uh, will slowly uh, increase and back off the brown methanol. Uh, as we move into ammonia, uh, scenario ammonia is an efficient molecule that carries uh, three hydrogen uh, atoms uh, and therefore uh, ammonia has to be green if it's going to be used as a decarbonization vector ammonia today has a significant amount of demand in the industrial sector so the question really is if you were making sufficient green ammonia wouldn't you want to displace the brown ammonia that exists in the industrial sector as a priority to decarbonize the entire ecosystem as opposed to putting it through to the maritime sector? And I think this is the discussion that will happen as green ammonia production ramps up is where do you deploy the molecule uh, in the interim? And if you go further out to hydrogen, hydrogen is not an easy molecule to handle for one. Two is to make green hydrogen is obviously a prerequisite to make green ammonia. But green ammonia is easier to move around than it is green hydrogen because of the cryogenic requirements and also the limitations on uh, explosivity of uh, hydrogen. Uh, so we need to 
think through where green hydrogen plays a role in the future. But at least in the next decade or so, uh, between uh, biofuels, bio LNG, and biomethanol, uh, we have an opportunity to start the process of decarbonization with the current infrastructure. The existing uh, vessels uh, have uh, most of them are they have uh, fitted uh, scrubbers and uh, adopted to the, the use of the soil to, uh, to uh, for low emissions, right? Uh, but from the technology uh, standpoint, uh, what changes you see in the future engines and uh, uh, the future ships that would be coming in uh, to, to comply with this uh, decarbonization? Yeah, so I think one strategy that we are beginning to see emerge is the dual fuel strategy or the dual fuel readiness strategy that, uh, that the ships are being built with uh, space and piping space that would be ready to take on the new infrastructure for this alternative fuel. So dual fuel readiness is definitely going to be one of those uh, strategies. The other strategy of once you have a scrubber, the, the, and depending on the scrubber technology, there is an, also an opportunity to use the scrubber technology to bolt on carbon removal systems or nitrogen removal or NOx removal systems. Uh, and this is being uh, actively looked at and researched to see how you can do onboard carbon capture. Uh, to decarbonize uh, fossil fuels or uh, carbon fuels. The challenge about onboard carbon capture, let alone the, the energy requirements and the storage space requirements, is you need to close a loop on the captured carbon. So it's not good enough for marine to say, maritime to say, I captured the carbon, now hand it over to the land side, and then you decide what to do with it. There must be an entire ecosystem to fix the CO2, and whether it's through sequestration in old oil fields, or it's through the utilization by fixing it into formic acid or building materials or cement, there must be a pathway to lock the CO2 that is captured on board this vessel. So these are the different pathways people are thinking about. There is a, even a one company that's using the captured CO2 in gaseous compressed gas form and feeding it into greenhouses. And the greenhouses, uh, the plants will then fix the CO2 within the, their own uh, uh, organic uh, substrate. So in terms of the uh, the future vessels have uh, uh, new engines and new models and uh, new fuels uh, being used and all that, that would happen anyway. But uh, when we are moving towards the goals of 2030-2050, uh, are there any alternatives for the existing uh, uh, vessels, uh, a kind of an interim measures like uh, fuel additives or uh, catalyst, which can reduce the emissions. Uh, do you know of anything that sort of thing is happening? Yeah, I mean, you know, even in the land transport industry, the use of fuel additives to increase energy efficiency, you know, and therefore low CO2 amount, there are these additives, but you know, you're talking about efficiency increases of what, 5%, 6%. You know, then there will be really good. That is not going to help decarbonize your maritime sector. We, we need 50, 80, 90, 100 percent reduction in CO2 emissions, right? We want zero emissions, right? And we and we start looking at the life cycle analysis and not just look at the vessel. Then a lot of these solutions, like additives and everything, will not make the cut because their production carbon footprint will be very high. Right, so so we really need to look at the alternative fuel scenario, and that's why I think for vessels today, biofuels, which is biogenic uh, in nature, would be a, a good way to actually uh, uh, decarbonize. And if if you have a carbon capture system on a biogenic biofuel to negative ter territory on your CO2 impact. So, you know, it is a, 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 a very effective way, at least in the short term. Uh, the, the other challenge on these alternative fuels, they don't all share the same amount of energy content. When you start looking at the vessel space, 
you know, uh, 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 for example, you would need uh, 2.5 times uh, uh, vessel space for storage of the fuel uh, versus uh, of LNG versus uh, you know, conventional fuels and 4.5 times if you look at hydrogen. You know, so the, the you know, you've got to consider that you know, for vessel space is a premium uh, because you, you want to use your space to move cargo and not to move fuel, you know. So so these are some of the other challenges. So I think in the short term, in terms of your current assets, uh, people should really look at uh, sending the right signals to the biofuel producers that if you make enough of it, I will take it. And I think this this uh, disconnect between supply and demand needs to disappear so that we can maximize the use uh, of biofuels. But I would caveat this: the the world is going to move to a multi-fuel scenario. We're not going to have biofuels cover the entire demand of marine maritime shipping, and ports need to decide based on its access to different new fuels, what kind of infrastructure does it want to invest in for their customers that are currently coming there? So there must be a conversation between the port and the customers coming, the vessels coming to that port, and the strategy must be aligned in terms of fuel provisions and infrastructure development. So we talked about all these fuels, hydrogen, LNG, biofuels, so uh, do you see a scenario that all these fuels will be coexisting uh, in the marketplace? Secondly, uh, these fuels uh, would be definitely costlier than the conventional uh, uh, fuel. So what would be the business model uh, emerging? Yeah, so the, the answer to the first question is yes, I, I, I do believe so. There will be uh, multiple fuels and in different regions you'll have more than one or the other uh, than other regions so it's all a question of accessibility um, part of the accessibility is also the cost to transport the fuel and move it around uh, and that's where the cost structures and business model needs to be optimized the production cost today is high but there, there is still room for technological innovation to reduce those production costs now, the, the, when you always say it's more expensive, it's more expensive than what? Today, with the war, the price of LNG has gone through the roof. So if you suddenly saw a big gap between alternative fuel and your LNG price, you might see it close or disappear. So these deltas are always variables and you can never predict because of the external environment. But we also must remember why are we doing this? Why are we uh, scratching our heads to change and use new fuels? We are not doing it because we uh, want to make more money and uh, to find a cheaper fuel. We're doing it because we believe climate change is an existential threat and we need to address and slow down that whole uh, climate change transition. Now, what, what price do you put on existentialism? Uh, and I think that's where people need to realize it. If you want to save the world and save your own grandchildren's life, what is the price you're willing not to pay for the additional cost on your shoe or your car or for the goods transported? You know, so I think the whole ecosystem needs to move together. Everyone shares the burden of this additional cost that we believe will help decarbonize the industry and hopefully uh, contribute to the fight against climate change. I think things need to be uh, refocused and recontextualized why we are making this change. We're not making this change to play with a new toy. We're making this change because we think we can make a better world for the future. Compared to other uh, uh, industries, uh, shipping industry seems to be under pressure because of IMO regulations on decarbonization. Um, so, uh, what ideally uh, governments and uh, industry should be doing uh, to, to see this uh, transition happen uh, uh, smoothly? 
And uh, second question is, uh, are we on track uh, uh, as an industry moving towards these goals? Yeah, so I think, I think I'm, I first thing you remember, IMO is actually made up of all the governments in the first place. It's the, it's the UN of maritime sector, right? So it is the very government that's imposing these targets onto the, their own ships, their own flags. Yeah? There's also a body that is emerging that these targets aren't aggressive enough, that we can do more and do faster to reduce. So we thought the 2030, 2050 targets were difficult. There are quarters within the IMO uh, membership that think we are, that is not good enough. We need to move faster. So the question really is, the first barrier is technology. If you don't have the engines to burn the new fuels, there's nothing, no matter how much you want to do it, there's nothing you can do about it. So the technologies need to move faster. Innovation needs to move faster. The other thing is, whilst there is a, a price gap, so this is where either through uh, tax incentives for first movers to create and start building the momentum on demand uh, is within the uh, jurisdiction of various governments who want to see this thing move forward in the right direction, you know, and that that's something that uh, uh, governments need to decide on the role they want to play there. And the and I think the governments also um, need to get some pressure from the consumer and the industry that, you know, if they want to move green, then they need to have mechanisms in place, be it market-based mechanisms, uh, carbon tax to equalize to to cater to the external factors of fossil fuel um you know and carbon credits and all these things must come together collectively to and to make the transition less painful from a business standpoint and more sustainable as well uh, from a business standpoint you know that uh, companies shipping companies can continue to operate uh, and operate profitably because 90% of our goods move by ships. And if we stop the shipping industry, a lot of us are not going to get our goods in the future. Dr. Sanjay, thank you very much for joining us and sharing a lot of insights uh, into the uh, decarbonization and how uh, maritime industry is moving towards the goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. My pleasure.